Welcome to our service this October 17th. Today is Mission and Service Sunday, where we will have the opportunity to consider the work of the United Church's Mission and Service Fund. Our theme today is the challenge of hunger in our times and how we can and are responding to this challenge. Our guest speaker today is the Reverend Dr. Robert Burroughs, who will be properly introduced later on in this service. Today, we light the Christ candle to signify that Christ is indeed the light of the world and is always with us. <clears throat> we light the memorial candle in memory of all those members of Knox United who have contributed so much to Knox but are no longer with us. Their contributions will never be forgotten. Please join with me in the call to worship as printed as bold on your screen. God of compassion and justice, the worship you choose for us is to lose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, to share bread with the hungry, to shelter the homeless poor. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. So in praise and wonder, we come to worship you, not just with our words, but with our hearts and our lives. Glory and honor be to you, O God, creator of a new heaven and a new earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of his friends, silently washes their feet. Master who acts as a slave to them. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are rich and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are near and far away. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. These are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love, all our neighbors to us and you. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of our friends, silently washing their feet. This is the way we should live with you. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. We continue in the opening prayer. Creator, conspire with us to create a world where all have access to nutritious and sustainable food sources, and none live with scarcity or food insecurity. Redeemer, save us from oppressive and unjust systems. Mobilize us to be part of a world response that works in partnership with those of good will to foster equitable resource sharing. Sustainer, 
cultivate our resilience and expand our imaginations so that we might continually find new ways to answer the call to end hunger until all may flourish. Amen. Now let us join our hearts together in the prayer, the prayer that our Lord has taught, the Lord's Prayer, in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us listen to the assurance of God's grace. O God, you offer the possibility of release. You lose the shackles of greed, freeing us from the urge to acquire at any cost, relieving us from the treadmill of busyness. We are your new releases, telling a story for this generation, feeding the hungry. We whisper peace, clothing the naked. We murmur hope, sheltering the homeless. We declare your faithfulness. Amen. Sing your praise to God eternal. Sing your praise to God the Son. Sing your praise to God the Spirit, living and forever one. God has made us, God has blessed us, God has called us to be true. God rules over all creation, daily making all things new. joined us. This is our moment of discovery time. So this is our mission and service Sunday. This is World Food Sunday. We have a guest speaker. 
We have beautiful music. This is a great service, absolutely. Well, I wanted to share with you today for our moment of discovery time, one of my favorite folk tales, the story of the stone soup. Have you heard of it before? You probably have if you've been in elementary school here in Canada. Well, it's a traditional folk tale found in many parts of the world, actually. And did you know in some versions, um, the main characters actually convince people that they can make soup from an old nail or an even an axe, maybe? Well, the versions that I'm most familiar with, it's all about the stone, right? Making a delicious pot of soup using stones. Interesting concept, isn't it? Well, it's a far more interesting tale and with what it teaches us in the end. And this, the version I want to share with you was actually uh, adapted in 2008 by Kevin Crawl for World Food Day, if you can believe it. So going back a few years. And this one focuses on ways that we can help other people. All right, so enjoy the story. Once upon a time, just as the sun was setting, three weary travelers came to the edge of a town. Their feet were blistered, their mouths were dry, and their bellies were aching with hunger. Oh, I'm starving, moaned the first. I'm exhausted, groaned the second. Let's stop in this town and ask for help, said the third. Now, the people who lived in this town were by no means rich, and what little food they had, they always kept for themselves, hiding it even from their friends and family. When they looked out of their houses and saw the three travelers, they said to each other, Look, hungry strangers, we know what they want. Quick, quick, let's hide all the food and pretend we have nothing. That's exactly what they did. Well, the travelers came to the first house and they knocked gently on the door. Good day and peace be with you, said the first. Will you please kindly share with us a little of your food? And a corner, maybe, where we can sleep for the night, added the second. We'll tell you all about our travels in return, promised the third. Sorry, said the man of the house. We gave all our spare food to the travelers um, who came here last week. And um, there's only one room in this house, said the man's wife. Both of them were lying. The travelers sighed and went to the next house. Go away, said the owners. The harvest was very bad this year and every bit of food we had is gone. They too were lying. At every house, the answer was the same. The townspeople always found an excuse. Their children were sick. They had relatives staying. They were going away. A plague of mice had eaten everything. One lie after another. The travelers knew that they were being lied to. But what could they do? They were just about to give up and leave the town when one of them, one of the travelers had an idea. The people have a lot to learn, he said. Let's maybe play a little trick on them and teach them a very big lesson. Ooh, an excellent idea, said the second. But what sort of trick, asked the third, and what kind of lesson? Gather around, said the first, and I'll tell you. And so, sh 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 in whispers and secret signs, he did. And as the plan unfolded, his two companions nodded and grinned from ear to ear. As soon as they were ready to put their plan into action, the first traveler spoke in a big, booming voice so that the nearby townspeople were sure to hear. How terribly sad that the poor people in this town have no food, he said. But never mind, we three shall go to the town square, and there, as night falls, we shall make a pot of delicious and nutritious stone soup. Well, when they heard this, the townspeople were extremely curious. They'd never heard of stone soup and wondered how it was made and what it tasted like. Well, well, how, how do you make stone soup? They asked the travelers. We'll gladly show you, replied the first. Follow us. Set, sorry. Pause for a moment, please. <laughs> it's what happens when you have cats and they want to be around for story hour. My apologies. Let's continue, shall we? <laughs> How do you make stone soup, they asked the travelers. We'll gladly show you, replied the first. Follow us, said the second. And bring, um, oh, bring a big empty pot with you and some firewood too, 
said the third. So they did. Arriving in the town square, one of the travelers made a fire. Another filled the empty pot with water, and the third placed it over the fire to boil. And now, said the first, for the special ingredients, with a grand and dramatic flourish, so that everyone could see, he reached into a leather satchel and took out three round, smooth stones and plopped them into the pot of water. Soon we shall feast, he exclaimed, stirring the pot with a big wooden spoon. Well, as the, number, uh, as the rumor of a feast spread around the town, an excited crowd began to gather in the square. Just as we planned, whispered the first traveler to his friends. After the pot of water had been boiling for some time, the travelers began to sniff the air and lick their lips. Mm, and now, said the first, I will taste it. As the travelers lifted a spoonful of bubbling water into his mouth, the crowd craned forward to hear his verdict. <gasps> it is completely delicious, he announced. At this, the crowd gasped and gurgled with delight. True, continued the traveler. Some people might say, though, that it needs a little salt and pepper. But apart from that, it's practically perfect. Well, no sooner had he said this than the townspeople sent their children hurrying home to fetch salt and pepper, which the clever travelers added to the pot. After a while, the second traveler tasted the soup. Mmm, he said, rubbing his belly and moaning with appreciation. These extraordinary stones do indeed make an excellent soup. Although, perhaps just a few carrots would make it more delicious. Well, don't you know, just then, an old woman in the crowd called out, Now that I think of it, I believe I may have a carrot or two in my house. And straight away she scurried home, and back she hobbled, carrying a whole sack full of sweet, crunchy carrots, which the travelers quickly sliced and added to the pot. I suppose a perfect stone soup should also have some onions, and perhaps maybe some cabbage too, said the third traveler. But what's the point of dreaming about such ingredients that we simply haven't got? Well, at this, don't you know, an old man's voice was heard from the middle of the crowd. I've got some onions, he cried, and cabbages too. And off he shuffled, returning a few moments later, wheeling a barrow full of onions and fresh green cabbage, which again, the travelers quickly shredded and put into the pot. And my friends, this story goes on as you can see the pattern and you can see what's happening. It's a fantastic story. Let me skip just right now towards the end. And here we go. Finally, the travelers announced the soup was ready. But don't worry, said the first, there's enough for everybody. Tables and chairs were placed in the square and bowls and spoons and napkins too. Torches were lit and decorations hung. In the middle of the hustle and bustle, a townsman called out, A soup as special as this deserves nothing but the best. Let's fetch bread and beer and barrels of wine. And so the feast began and everyone agreed that they'd never tasted anything so delicious in their lives. And when the feast was over, the townspeople listened with rapt attention as the travelers told their tales from far and wide. And the townspeople told the travelers all about their lives in the town. And when there, and then there was singing and dancing until late into the night. Early in the morning, just as the sun was rising, the travelers departed. Thank you so much for teaching us how to make stone soup, said the townspeople. You're very welcome, replied the travelers. Be sure to visit us again. We certainly will. Nobody knows for sure whether the townspeople ever realized that they'd been tricked that night. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because they certainly did learn a very important lesson that when we each give a little, we can achieve a lot. I hope you enjoyed the story on this very special World Food Sunday. May you gather with friends and family and enjoy a good meal, but hold in prayer those in need. God bless. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 7 to 11. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you 
and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing fingers and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noon day. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fell. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Knox. World Food Sunday brings to attention the response to hunger and food insecurity in our community. With the COVID-19 pandemic, this response has been greater than ever. Knox is out of the cold program, transitioned into a COVID-19 outreach with Agent Court Community Services, known to us as AXA, distributing Sunday meal packages. The initial packages required was 50, and due to the growing need, 65, then 85, and now 100. Each package contains two sandwiches and two bottles of water, a drink box, fresh fruit, and snacks. Enough food for one day. To stretch the budget, some hosts collaborate with shopping for fresh and prepared items for the lunch bags at discounted prices. Applying for grants is another area. One success is the TELUS Foundation, which supports by providing face masks and $10,000. Some of the funds have been used to purchase in bulk personal care items such as socks, Kleenex packets, body wipes, to name a few. Funds have also been held in reserve to explore self-sustaining initiatives. Preparing sandwiches to supplement meals at the Salvation Army's Holiday Inn Shelter located in Scarborough. Last Saturday, 20 sandwiches were delivered to start the process. As of today, Sunday, the 17th of October, 5,745 meal packages, yes, I reviewed the numbers twice, were prepared by 19 community and faith-based hosts and their teams. Access drop-in manager shared some of the following but essential statistics. Numbers have increased by 75% since March 2020 due to the influx of homeless individuals staying at local hotel shelters and community members losing employment. Support from Knox is out of the cold program hosts from March 2020 to the present has been integral to meeting the increased community need and supporting Access North increased days of operation, now seven days a week. Meal packages provided offers the community nutritious meals, fresh fruit, snacks, and hygiene packages. Sunday numbers have increased since host groups began providing meal packages and committee members tell staff they look forward to receiving their Sunday meal packages. And on a personal note, I'm pleased to say when we offered Friday evening meals on site, guests look forward to the meals because we had some amazing cooks in the program. And hopefully one day we will be able to return to this. There are two internal initiatives by the Knox congregation. Yesterday, there was a rally to support the local food bank by collecting non-perishable and canned items. Feed the Freezer, introduced by the late Donna Martin, who adopted the program from Maple Grove United in Oakville. Cooks in the congregation prepare mains, soups, and desserts, which are placed in the freezer and shared with those who are ill and need a hand up. It was also shared that Reverend Bright, prior to this, would purchase cookies for his visits. And in continuing his monthly visits, and especially to an adult group home, he now has a selection of cookies from the freezer. With COVID, the frozen meals are delivered to the front door with a smile and a hello and a how are you, and in other instances, left at the doorstep. All of these efforts 
go a long way to overcome food insecurity and hunger in our community. I extend thanks to those who continue to support and welcome to those who wish to join the team. It gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce our guest preacher, the Reverend Bob Burroughs. Bob grew up here in Agincourt in the Burroughs family home on Midland Avenue, just across the road from Agincourt Collegiate. While growing up, Bob was very active in the life and work of Knox. He attended our church school, participated in groups for young people, and sang in our choir. After completing high school, Bob attended Victoria College at the University of Toronto, followed by further studies at Emmanuel. In 1959, he graduated with a Master of Divinity degree and was awarded the Sanford Gold Medal given to a graduating divinity student for excellence in scholarship, character, and ability. In 1960, after a year of additional studies at St. Andrews University in Scotland, Bob became the missionary captain of the United Church Mission Boat, the Thomas Crosby Four, based at Ocean Falls, BC. For the next two years, Bob visited 50 isolated native villages, lighthouses, and fishing and logging communities along the British Columbia coast. Following a transfer in 1962 to Alert Bay off the northeast coast of Vancouver Island, Bob learned to pilot a Cessna float plane in order to more easily visit the isolated settlements near the north end of the, of the island. Four years later, Bob began his ministry at First United Church in Vancouver among the very vulnerable residents of the downtown east side. To this day, Bob is still active at First United and, over many years, has been a big part of numerous initiatives undertaken to improve the lives of the people living on the streets and in one-room accommodations in the area. Please welcome the Reverend Bob Burroughs to our pulpit this morning. First of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation to share in this Food Sunday service in this church where I grew up. I am so grateful for many memories of Mrs. J. L. Patterson's Sunday School for Preschoolers, which was downstairs at this end of the church, and a few years later, sitting in the front pew uh, with my grandparents. And the reason that I was in the front pew with my grandparents was that my grandfather was hard of hearing and needed to be up close, and my mother and father were both in the choir, and so uh, the, my sisters were in a special Sunday school class that didn't involve them coming to church. So I remember very clearly the sitting between my grandparents and listening to the sermons. I am also grateful for the youth group that was here, Club 730, for several years, and so many of our friends from school and the community of our own age were active in the youth group as well as singing in the church choir here. But I'm also grateful for the friendship and support of so many families in this congregation as I went through the years of preparation for ministry. Today, we focus on the challenge of hunger. And I don't have any vivid memories of going without food during my childhood years in this community. We were fortunate to have a good-sized vegetable garden and a grandfather to look after it. But eventually, as most of you will know, there were hungry, hungry people in this surrounding community. And over 40 years ago, a food bank was established. And you and members of this congregation, even this week, have been involved and continue to be involved in trying to bring food security to many people. I commend the volunteers for doing this very important and often 
challenging work. As a teenager, I first heard alarming stories of hungry people. While I sat here in the choir loft at Knox United Church. Year after year, on the second Sunday of December, the Reverend Wesley Honeyset was the guest preacher. He was the minister in charge of Fred Victor Mission in downtown Toronto, and we were encouraged to respond to the needs of these hungry, unfortunate people. Little did I realize that 15 years later, I would be addressing the same situation in Vancouver at First United Church where we responded to the needs of hundreds of single parent families and single men who had become too old to work in the logging and fishing industries. These men were generally crammed into tiny rooms in Buildings called hotels, but they weren't really hotels. They were single room occupancy and, and they had no chance for any kind of uh, activity within there except to sleep. The single men, when they came to the church, were given a quick interview and usually supplied with a 75 cent meal ticket for a three course meal at the Lenity Cafe, which was directly across Hastings Street from the church. The families in need, usually single moms, were given a bag of donated groceries. Soup lines did exist at that time in the 1960s and 70s in Vancouver, run by the Salvation Army and by one or two other missions. But our staff team at First United Church worked really hard to move in a different direction. We believe that it was our calling to help people stand on their own feet and make their own decisions. Several churches cooperated to establish a drop-in center that we call and is still called the dugout. The dugout was the name given because a friend of mine who had been in the advertising business in Seattle and then moved his camp family up to an isolated spot on the West Coast because he didn't want them uh, want to be part of a country that was fighting in Vietnam. He was in the advertising business. And so I went to him when we were establishing this drop-in center and said, what should we call it? And that was on a Tuesday. And he said to come back on the Friday and he would have an answer. And so he said, you should call it the dugout, because especially in the First World War, that's where the soldiers would come back from the front lines to get rested, to get patched up, to get some food, some rest, and, and uh, then go back to the front lines again. And so the dugout, which we only use in baseball, uh, no, hardly ever use the term again, continues to be the name of the drop-in center in the downtown east side of Vancouver. We were fortunate when we got it going that there was a retired salesman, 74 years old, one of the founding members of the first Alcoholics Anonymous group in Vancouver in 1946. And he was only there two months before he had started an AA meeting not just once a week, every day. And apart from COVID, the AA group at the dugout has met every day since the 1st of April, 1968. Hundreds and hundreds of men and women have been able to regain their self-confidence and their sobriety. And many of them became volunteers at the dugout because the dugout was essentially operated by volunteers. Coffee was served, and this all got started using the volunteers, not because there was a genius behind it. One day I went down about a week before the dugout was to open to 
see how they were getting along with the painting and scraping and we had to install a new bathroom and all the requirements uh, were met and uh, Bruce was up one of these tall step ladders uh, painting in the ceiling and he said uh, Bob who's gonna who's gonna run this place uh, do the work you know when we open and I said uh, well, I don't know. Volunteers. We have a couple of men, that retired school principals, that that indicated they would help. And then I said, "Bruce, why do you ask me that?" And he said, "Well, me and the boys. There were six people, all on welfare, or five on welfare and one on an army pension, who spent six weeks doing all the work to get this abandoned warehouse in shape to be a drop-in center." And they had decided that they're going to need some kind of a bouncer because they didn't want some drunk person coming in and spoiling it for everybody. And Larry Waldenberger said he would do that. And Tom Boston is pretty shy and doesn't like being around people. And, and he said that he'll come in at night and do all the janitor work and clean the washrooms and you know make sure that everything's tidy. And Bill and Pete and Stan and I will take turns making the coffee and serving the coffee. For years afterward, I was getting all this credit for this great idea that you can operate a place for $15,000 a year and have only a salary. Our manager worked for $100 a month, worked three hours every every morning. Uh, and, and how can you do this? Volunteers. And so the volunteers would get uh, maybe a lunch ticket uh, or maybe a couple of extra cups of coffee uh, for helping out for two or three hours, but the dugout continues to have this role in the community. Uh, and I thought by the time I left there in the mid 70s that that was maybe where it would end. But about 10 years later, some of the soup lines had broken down, weren't happening in the city, and the dugout uh, volunteers felt that there was a need for for a good nourishing first meal of the day. And so 30 years ago they started serving 150 to 200 people every morning at 7 o'clock. And that has continued and they have not missed one day even with COVID. Most other places operating in Vancouver shut down and many of them have closed permanently. But the dugout was able to keep going, three part-time staff people and a lot of volunteers and nutritious soup and buns and coffee are provided. So some of the food challenges are being met. But we are reminded frequently of all the children in the communities across Canada. Children who go to school hungry each morning. So programs are organized to provide a healthy meal for these children. You will know in your part of Canada that these are existing and we have them in British Columbia. But the big question is why? What are the reasons that hunger is such a challenge in our society at this time? Well, one reason is the inadequacy of social assistance rates for families in all our provinces. Political decisions must be made to address this. Governments establish what they call a basic living wage for individuals and families and then provide just over half of that amount as the welfare rates in their communities. We are called as Christians, as members of our community, to use our democratic voices to change this. Another reason for the dilemma is food waste. A dozen years ago, an 80-year-old volunteer at First United Church approached me with a surprising story. The previous evening, she had been shopping at the supermarket in her community and was chatting with the bakery manager. He pointed to the racks of leftover bread, and when she asked, what would happen to them, 
He said, sadly, we have to throw it all out. This didn't seem like a very good thing to Barbara. And she began the next morning in her rather small car, making two trips a day to get all the leftover bakery products from this one place in North Vancouver down to First United Church. And after a few months, there was so much coming in that it was more than could be properly used at First United. And Barbara came to me again and said, what shall I do now? They, they don't want all this bread. So I drove her down to the dugout and introduced her to the people there. And from that day to this, the bread comes from several different bakeries and supermarkets. We have a team of 18 volunteers who take turns, usually doing one day a week, but it's usually a, a two or two and a half hour volunteer uh, effort. And, uh, and, and the food is not being thrown out and wasted at these places, but usually within a couple of hours, the bakery products are in the hands of very deserving people. But the statistics around food waste are staggering. There are 35 and a half million tons of food thrown out each year in Canada, at least that was reported last week, approximately one ton for every person in our country. That is more than half of all food production. It is valued at $50 billion dollars and 32% of all the food that is thrown away could be directed to those in need. It is edible food. A third reason why hunger faces huge challenges is because of climate change. In various communities across Canada, the record-breaking heat this year has resulted in tragically low crops in fields and orchards. So governments need to increase the support to scientists and to all those seeking to understand the impact of environmental changes all over the world. There are some encouraging things happening. I have been made aware this week of the kind of things that are happening in and through people in this congregation as food preparation is being encouraged not only by collecting food for food bank, but preparing food for hungry people and finding ways of distributing it responsibly. But the mission and service department of our church sends out a newsletter two or three times a year and the one that came just last week to my attention had some really interesting stories about the way in which we in our churches through our support of mission and service funds can help with major projects. After multiple disasters in the Philippines, our church along with other alliance partners provided food, farming equipment, and seeds that supported more than 12,000 people. Close to home, the Fred Victor Mission has seen a 40% increase in meals served since the pandemic began. And it also runs over 240 gardens where community members garden together. The third example that was given comes from far away, from Kenya. Emmanuel Baya went to bed hungry very often. His parents both died when he was a young child and he was always concerned as he grew up about other children that didn't go to school because they were spending all their time searching for food. In 2008, he opened a children's center where almost 300 children received warm, healthy meals and education. But he still wanted to do more. 
and he enrolled in the Asian Rural Institute. There he learned organic farming techniques. He then opened a demonstration farm next to the Children's Center, and it is now a learning hub for seven surrounding communities. His life and work obviously inspires others. He says, when we grow our own food, we heal a broken relationship between us and nature. What can be done in Agent Court, in Scarborough, in Greater Toronto? You are part of things called Feed Ontario. You're part of AXA and, and the more local food bank and the other programs. You are called upon to uh, support projects and special campaigns to raise funds to help support and feed people who are hungry. My mind goes back to what I think was my introduction to concerns about hunger and food care. Hartley Bay is a small First Nations village on the northwest coast of British Columbia, 100 miles south of Prince Rupert. When I first went there on the mission boat in 1960, there were about 200, 220 people living in Hartley Bay. They were fishing and logging, but mostly they were making their success, the success of their fishing careers. But there were two families, each with three or four children, who did not have employment, did not have work, and for one reason or another were unable to get work. And I learned after I had been there a few months that these families were cared for because all the other people in Hartley Bay quietly, with dignity, ensured that there was food and clothing and all essentials for these two families. And it was never talked about in the community. And visiting every few weeks as I did, I would never have known if someone hadn't answered my question about, like, how do they get by if he doesn't work? They were very proud. This was 1961, 62. Very proud of the fact that they didn't have any families on welfare. And they were determined as a council that they weren't going to have any. And so this was partly to save their reputation, but it was also, for me, a demonstration of how people quietly and with dignity can ensure that people are not hungry. May we do all that we can to ensure that we are supporting the causes and the projects that are particularly important with the concerns of world hunger surrounding us. Amen.
Offering prayer. Generous God, we offer our gifts in response to your call to care. We offer them with gratitude and love, trusting that you will use them to feed bodies, minds, and hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the poor, hungry, and neglected all over the world, that their cries for daily bread may inspire works of compassion and mercy among those to whom much has been given. We pray for the farmers with limited or marginal land throughout the world. For those who lack access to water and other resources, and for the light of research and support services to shine in the lives of all God's people. Let us pray for an end to pandemic disease throughout the world, particularly those excavated by lack of nutritious food and outright hunger. That plagues of death may no longer fuel poverty, destabilize nations, and inhibit reconciliation, restoration throughout the world. We pray for an end to the waste and desecration of God's creation, for access to the fruits of creation to be shared equally among all people, and for communities and nations to find sustenance in the fruits of the earth and the water God has given us. Let us pray for all nations and people who already enjoy the abundance of creation and the blessings of prosperity, that their hearts may be lifted up to the needs of the poor and afflicted, and partnerships between rich and poor for the reconciliation of the world may flourish and grow. We are reminded of the word of God today. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. We pray for the poor, hungry, and the neglected in our community and beyond. May we all flourish. Amen. Thank you. 
is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your healing power. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Or oh, spirit, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring It is the will of God that we all may flourish. It is the will of God we continue to fight the good fight of faith against hunger. Hunger in our community and beyond. May God's peace be with you. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go 